just that good. Protector, provider, healer, keeper. It's just that good. Wait for 
Marcela. This morning, you gave me a right time to pray. To you gave me strength in my body. You gave me breath in my lungs. You did it, Lord. You did it for me. You did it for me. was strong enough to pick us up and you made a way when my back was against the wall and it looked as if it was over God you made a way so we're standing here only because you made us you move mountains You call falls With your power God Perform miracles There is nothing Hallelujah That's impossible So we're standing here Only because you move mountain, you move mountain, yeah. You cause walls to fall with your power. Perform miracles, perform miracles. There is nothing, there is nothing that's impossible. Hallelujah. That's impossible. We're standing here. And we're standing here only because, only because you, you move made. mountain, sing. You move the cause walls to fall. Believe it. With your power, With God. Your power. Perform miracles. Perform miracles. There, is there is nothing, God. There is nothing. That's impossible. That's impossible. So we're standing here only because you made up. You made a way. Yeah. You made a way. Just put your mind on him, man. You made a way. Yes, you did, God. You made Listen. a way. Don't know why. Don't know how, but you did it. Yeah. Made a way. Don't know how, but you Don't know how, but you did it. Made Think about it. I don't know how, but you did it. Don't know how, but you don't did know it. how, but you don't did it. I see you. But you don't did know it. how, but you don't did know it. How, but you don't did know it. how, but you don't did it. Don't know how, but you don't know why. Don't know why, but I'm grateful. Yeah. Don't know why, but I'm grateful. Don't know why, but I'm grateful. Yeah. Don't know why, but I'm grateful. Made 
the way. Listen. When our back was against the wall. And it looked as if it was over. I'm just connecting. You. You made a way. Listen. When our back was against the wall. And it looked as if it was over. God, you. You made a way. So we're grateful. And we're standing here. Only because you made a way. Hallelujah.
for leading us in our worship today. I want to welcome all of our guests who stood today and thank you for your testimonies today. We have some powerful testimonies of being clean from addiction. And the one brother said, even when I fall, what did he say? There's a cushion. Amen. I'm putting, I'm, I'm putting that on social media. <laughs> Even when I fall, there's a cushion. God bless you, sir. I appreciate that. For those who don't know, my name is Damon Lynch III. I'm the proud pastor of this great church, New Prospect Baptist Church, here in Cincinnati, Ohio, 1580 Summit Road, in the community called Roseline. We welcome all who are in the house. We welcome those of you watching us online. Those of you who will hear this later in the week on the radio, we thank you for your faithful listening as well. And we, again, just give God praise. Thank, give God praise for the praise team today, musicians. Amen. 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 Tough, tough subject this morning. Um, and somebody gave me put this up for me after the 8 o'clock service. I don't know uh, if there's a, there's, we got a lot of these, like a lot, a lot. Say that one more time. All right, I got that. That's this one, right? Okay. All right. What this is, ladies and gentlemen, it is suicide warning signs for youth. That's what this is. Suicide Warning Signs for Youth. The paper is uh, 988 Suicide Crisis Lifeline. And there's information on that as well. And one of the things it says on here, it says in 2020 alone, the U.S. had uh, one death by suicide every 11 minutes. And for people aged 10 to 34, suicide is the leading cause of death. Suicide is the leading cause of death. 
Most of you know, if you have read the Bible or know anything about the Bible, you know about some suicides in the Bible, right? What, what suicide do you know most about? What was his name? Judas. You know about Judas. Judas took his own life. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And when it was all said and done, Judas figured the only way out was to take his own life. There is another suicide in the Bible by a man by the name of Samson. Samson took his own life. Samson, after uh, being blinded and uh, abused by the Philistines, asked God, said, well, as his strength came back, he said, just, just give me one more chance. Allow me to put my hands on the pillars. And while there, there was, the Bible says there was 3,000 people upstairs and people downstairs. And Samson said, if I can get to the pillars, I'm going to push. And he said, I'm going to kill everybody in here, including myself. Samson didn't say, God, let me kill these people and walk. He said, no, I'm going to kill them and kill me too. Those are the two uh, known suicides in scripture. But there is a powerful passage today about in the scripture about a suicide prevention. And that's what I want to talk about today is suicide prevention as it relates to young African-American boys and girls. Because most of us don't realize that the numbers say between 2001 and 2017, suicide among young black girls rose by 182%. From 2001 to 2017, the suicide rates rose by 182% of young black girls. In boys, it rose by 60% in the same time frame. There's an issue, there's a problem that oftentimes we in the black community don't face because remember, you remember, you remember growing up, we used to say what? Black people don't what? Black people don't commit suicide, remember that? Yeah, we grew up, that's what they told us, that's what we believed, that black people don't commit suicide, that's a white people thing. And, and part of the reasoning we probably felt that way is that after all the hell black people had caught in this country, after all the injustices, after slavery and Jim Crow and the racism, and, and we still survived, there was this great feeling, well, black people, we don't quit. We don't give up, we persevere, we make it through. Black people don't commit suicide. I don't know if that was even true back then, but we said it, but now it is not true. And now the highest suicide rate in the black community is our children, our children, your grandbabies, our young people. So black people, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we are committing suicide. But so you've got the known suicides in scripture, Judas and Samson, but I want to show you one suicide that was prevented because our whole goal is how do we prevent suicide in the black community? So give me Acts chapter 16. I'm going to start at verse 16 and we're going to look at suicide prevention. You can stand with me. Acts 16, 16, going down to verse 34. Acts 16, 16. And for all of us in the room, make sure you get this sheet so your children know they can call 988. Acts 16, 16 says this. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, this is Paul and Silas, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She predicted the future. And it's funny, my daughter, I don't know if she's upstairs or downstairs right now, but when we're in the car riding, there's this commercial that comes on a lot. And it says, if you want skin, go to Colorado. If you want bagels, go to New York. He says, but if you want a psychic, go to California. And they're promoting California psychics, somebody who's going to predict your future. This woman had the spirit to predict the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept us up for many days. And finally, Paul said, she's getting on my nerves. <laughs> this lady's getting on my nerves. Even though what she may be saying is correct, because the devil will tell the truth every now and then. 
but, but she's getting on my nerves. So finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the, to who? Not, not the woman, but to the spirit that's in the woman. He said to the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates. The magistrates are like the judges when you and I go down, downtown. And this is what they said. These men are Jews and they are throwing our city into an uproar. By advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be what? Stripped, beaten with rods. After they had been what? Severely flogged. Stripped, beaten, flogged. And then they were thrown into prison. All they did was cast out a demon, but they impacted somebody's money. You, you, who, what, who was it? Some movie I watched. Said, Don't mess with a man's money. Don't come between a man and his money. They came between the man and his money. And now they've been beaten, stripped, flogged, and thrown in the jail. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, talking about the jailer, he put them not only in jail, but in the inner cell. He takes his job serious. And not only are they in prison in the inner cell, he said, but let me go one step further and then fasten their feet in the stocks. Now imagine, ladies and gentlemen, this is you. you, you you've just been beaten severely, flogged, beaten with rods, arrested put not only in prison, but in the inner prison and your feet are in the stocks. And then the text says this about midnight, midnight, about midnight. Now you've got two choices in this situation. You can be complaining you can be mad as hell. You can be angry. You can be cussing. You can be fussing. I, you know you. <laughs> you know you. <laughs> cussing and fussing. This is, this is wrong. This is unjust. Blah, I'm gonna get Johnny Cochran. You know, or now what's the new guy? Johnny's dead. What's the, what's the guy? Crump. I'm calling Crump. At midnight, Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. Remember the condition they're in. Backs are sore. Bloody. They've been beaten. They're in prison. And they at midnight are praying and singing to God. And the other prisoners are listening to them. They're singing loud enough to wake up the whole jail. And then suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. You and I who've lived here, we've been through a few earthquakes. The earth is shook in our area a couple times, but not like this. This is like a seven or eight. This earthquake is so violent that it shook the entire foundation of the prison. And not only that, at once, how many? All the prison doors flew open. And everybody's chains were loose. This is a breakout. <laughs> this is a breakout. He didn't just open the prison for Paul and Silas. Everybody's. The jailer did what? Now, I don't know his total job description. 
but I don't know if you're supposed to be asleep. <laughs> if you got the night shift, I don't know if you're supposed to be asleep, but, but at midnight. But I guess he figured everybody's locked up. I got them tight. He, he, he fell asleep. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to do what? Commit suicide. He drew his sword and was about to commit suicide. And here's the interesting thing. Because he what? Thought. That's the problem right there. Because he thought. Because he thought. Nobody loves me. Because he thought. That I'm a failure. Uh, I'm a burden. Because he thought. That life is not worth living. Because he thought that everybody in school teases me. Because he thought that because I'm being bullied. I ought to just go ahead and take my life. He drew his sword, was about to commit suicide because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, here's suicide prevention. Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. Don't harm yourself. It's not always what it looks like. It's not always what it seems. It's not always as bad as you think it is. Don't harm yourself. Do not take your own life. Don't cut yourself. Don't hang yourself. Don't shoot yourself. Don't take pills. Don't harm yourself. Don't harm yourself, he said. Not only did he say that, the next thing he said, because we are all here. What you thought was not true. Nobody left. Nobody broke out. We are all here. Then the jailer called for lights. If he had done his investigation before, he wouldn't have been in a position with his sword out ready to take his own life. If he had gone in with the lights before, then he calls for lights, rush in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, this is the man he went from, I'm going to kill myself, to now saying, what do I need to do to be saved? <laughs> the 988 for him was Paul and Silas. There wasn't a 98 number, 988 number he could call or text. It was happened to be two preachers who were there when he was needed the most. He went from I'm about to kill myself to now what do I need to do to be saved? They said believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved not only you but your whole house. Then they spoke to him the word of the Lord. They spoke to him the word of the Lord. What is that? They talked to him about Jesus Christ. They talked to him about why Jesus came to earth, that he died. He died for their sins. He died for their justification. He died that they might have life. Don't harm yourself. He already took care of that. They spoke to him the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them. He did what? Wash their wounds. And immediately he and his household were baptized. What time they get baptized? Midnight. You can't trust that the first Sunday is going to come. <laughs> we, we, we may not make it the first Sunday, but we got right now. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He, the jailer was filled with joy. Because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. God bless his word. You may be seated. That is suicide prevention. 
suicide prevention. What I want us to do today is learn the risk factors. I have a teenager. I have a 13-year-old daughter. I have a teenager. And, and, and many of these risk factors that I see on this sheet, and hopefully you will get one of those, I, I watch and, 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 and I worry. I watch the changes in emotions. And I, and I don't want to be the parent who comes home and finds their son or their daughter has taken their own life. It is happening far too much in the black community that used to say black folk don't commit suicide. Again, I don't know if that was true or not, but I know it is not true now. And ladies and gentlemen, it is our young people one of the youngest people in the city who committed suicide, I did his eulogy, Gabriel Ty. His mom was a member of our church. It was painful. Can you imagine being the mother or the father who comes home and finds your child who has hung themselves? This is serious. This is serious. And unless you know what the warning signs are, and unless you as a parent know that you need to call somebody to get your young person the help he or she needs. Because right now, we can't play it off like we used to play it off. So when your kid starts talking about, I don't want to live anymore, you can't just act like you better get your ass up, blah, 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 blah. Like, oh, that, that doesn't work anymore. Better go sit down somewhere. That doesn't work anymore. Because when they start talking it, they, 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 if it goes from there to they start planning it. And if they get to the point where they start planning it, it's a dangerous time. Our young people are going through a lot. They got interpersonal problems they're dealing with. They got problems of dealing with the other young people. Bullying is still real. Now, again, I don't, I, I agree with, with Solomon who said there's nothing new under the sun. I, I think there just may be new degrees of it. Cause, cause nothing I'm going to tell you is new. We had bullies when I grew up. We had problems when I grew up. Mental health now is an issue with young people. Again, I don't believe anything is new, but I don't know. I, I, I guess. Growing up, there were some of us with mental health issues. We just said, he bad. <laughs> or we said, boy, got problems. We never got diagnosed. We never got diagnosed. So we never went on medication. So, so I'm, I don't believe it's new, but I think the degree of it first time I was asked, one of our members said, can you go to the hospital and see my, my, my son, my grandson? So where is he? He said, he's out there on Hamilton. I said, Hamilton? What? It's children's on Hamilton. I, I just didn't know there was a children's on Hamilton. And I went. And I was like, man, it is an entire hospital for young people dealing with mental problems, mental stress. I, I'd never seen it. This was years ago, floor after floor of young people. And a lot of those young people looked like they could have been ours. Problems at school. Problems at school. We had some teachers speak that this morning at the eight o'clock worship. And there's probably some teachers here today. I mean, school was school when we went up. School was school. You had the good kids, the bad kids. You, it was school. You had... I mean, it was school. We went for school. We, we, we either learned or we acted up and we acted up and we learned. It was school. We had lunch. It was school. Schools ain't the same. Schools aren't the same. And I hear this all across the country. And I hear this from teachers who love kids. Who say, Pastor, these kids is off the chain. We rode the bus to school. Sister Adrian to tell you, I rode the bus to school my entire life in school. It was on the bus. And I'm sure several, some days we made the bus driver mad. 
But now the bus drivers say, we quit. We quit. They don't pay us enough to try to drive your little kid to school, your grandson, your great, your granddaughter to school and, and catch the hell that we catch just trying to get them back and forth to school. And then they got conflict at home. They're dealing with conflict at home. Home ain't what it used to be. The lady stood up at the 8 o'clock server. She said, she said, but most of us don't realize it. She said, there are about 800 students at Woodward High School. She said, over 50% of them would be considered homeless. They don't have a permanent address. They couch surf. It's no wonder the numbers of young people deciding to take their life are going up. We've got to bring them back down. You ever, I know most of you, you social workers, you've heard of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. That's what they call it, adverse childhood experiences. And again, I don't believe there's anything new. I think the degrees of it are greater. Adverse childhood experiences, young people dealing with abuse, emotional abuse. Again, I don't think anything is new, just the degrees of it, emotional abuse. I mean, if you're a child, a young kid, a teenager, and somebody's always telling you stupid, you get on my nerves, I can't stand you, get out my face, leave me alone, go sit down somewhere. Day after day after day, and all you said was mama. <laughs> you just said mama. And then you get all this emotional abuse. On top of that, then you get the physical abuse. Physical abuse. We got whoopings. Yeah, we got whoopings. It was called punishment. It was called punishment. But I don't equate that to at least what I got to physical abuse. I didn't like the whoopings, but I deserved them. But, but physical abuse, physical abuse is that whenever you walk past the kid, the kid flinches. The kid flinches because they don't know if they're going to get hit or not. And they can be hit for no reason at all. They can be hit because daddy or boyfriend or mama is just having a bad day. And then, of course, there's the one that I particularly really, really hate, sexual abuse. And so I got to live through that and still get up in the morning and go to school. And you expect me to be doing well. And again, I don't believe there's anything new, just degrees of it. We've always had nasty uncles. There's always been some nasty uncle in the family, a nasty granddaddy in the family. And to that, ladies and gentlemen, and I know, I know, because I am an uncle. So I know uncle means that's your brother. And I know you, but if you know. That means that's your, that's your relative, that's your, your uncle, your brother, who might be molesting your child. I don't, I don't, I never did, never will. I, I don't let my daughter sit on nobody's lap. <laughs> Nobody, I don't care if you her brother. You don't sit on nobody's lap. I will quickly tell her, get up. Our children deal with this. They're dealing with this. That's, then, then there's the abuse in the home. Substance abuse. Everybody's getting high. 
mental illness in the home, divorce, separation, incarceration. Mama's locked up. Daddy's locked up. We just went to the women's prison last Sunday. Pastor Wilson and I and the praise team, we went to the women's prison full of women. They got kids back home. We always talk about daddy being locked up. Go to the women's prison. It works both ways. Full of sisters and women in there. Children still back here at home. Domestic violence. I, 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 I hate sexual abuse. I hate them all. And I hate domestic violence. I hate, I hate, and it's usually perpetrated against women. I hate a man who puts his hands on a woman and figures it's his job to smack her around and punch her and beat her up. When it is actually supposed to be his job to protect her. It is, it is oxymoronic. It is crazy that the man who was supposed to love you and protect you is the man who keeps putting his hands on you. Let me say that again, ladies, just so you, you, you catch it. You catch it. No man ought to be putting his hands on you. And if there's a man out there who did it, you ought to have a man somewhere who handles that. But if it is your man, If it's your man who's supposed to be the one who says he loves you and supposed to be the one that protects you from anything else, if he's the one beating you, somehow we got to figure out a way to get you out of that. And the sooner the better. The first time he slaps the taste out of your mouth ought to be the last time. Let me say it like this for some of you. Should have been the last time. I'm sensitive to the fact that there's some women in here who have been in those abusive relationships and there's some women in here who are in that abusive relationship. And I am sensitive to the fact that it ain't just that easy to get out of it. I understand that it's not just that easy to walk away from it. What I cannot stomach though is if there's some men in here that are guilty of it. I understand there might be some sisters in here and you are in that and you feel trapped. But if there's some brothers in here and you are he, and church is a good place to be, but if you're going to keep coming here and keep doing that, then that brother needs to be straightened out. In the nation of Islam, and there's a brother that we all know, he, he part of our church, he's in the nation. He will tell you that he was guilty of that. You know what the brothers from the nation did? They went by his house and they tuned him up. He will tell you, you know who I'm talking about. He will tell you the brothers from the nation heard about it, went by his house and tuned him up because they were making clear that if you were one of us, we don't do that. Our children see that. Some of us grew up in a household where you saw domestic violence. 
And we all know what you say when you see it is, I would never do that. And we also know what happens. It's because it's what you saw. We have that happening in the house. And then outside the house, our young people deal with bullying. They deal with the community violence. You can go, when I was in school, elementary school, grade school, you could have came to our class and you could have said, how many in here know somebody who's been shot? No hand would have went up. We would have looked at you like, huh? How many of us know somebody been shot? No hand would have gone up. You can go to these schools today and ask the same question and every hand will go up. They deal with this community violence. Carrie talked about, and, and, and I hope that I can take advantage of it. If you're 55 and over, you're going to learn CPR. And everybody ought to learn that in this free course, which makes it even better. But you know what we're also teaching now in the black community? What to do with bullet wounds. They are now teaching. They will come and teach you what to do when somebody is shot. The first thing they obviously tell you to do is call 911. After that, they're going to teach you how to do a tourniquet. <laughs> that, that stuff they used to learn on the battlefield. That's what they used to teach. So you would learn that on the battlefield. They are now teaching that in the black community. How to do a tourniquet. To stop somebody from bleeding to death after they've been shot. This is what our young people are dealing with. And the suicide rates are skyrocketing. And if you've got a teenager like I do, if you've got a grandkid who's a teenager like many of you do, you need to be concerned about this. Because you don't really know what they're thinking. You don't really know what's going on in their mind. You've got to figure out a way to talk to them. And if you've ever talked to a teenager, you know the answer you normally get. If you ask them, why, why, why are you so sad? I don't know. But you can't let I don't know be the answer. I don't know. That's going to be the first answer you get. I don't know. I just am. Why, 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 why are you mad all the time? What's the matter? I don't know. You got to go deeper than I don't know. What, 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 in the last few weeks, what is it that just made you feel this way? I don't know. Well, well, tell me something. Just, just tell me anything. What, what can we do to make you feel better? What can we do to make you happier, get more joy? Now, you may get another. What? I don't know. Well, at some point, if you keep getting I don't knows, say, look, we need to call this number. 988. We, we, you need to go talk to somebody. Because obviously as a parent, grandparent, I'm not getting anywhere with this. We need to go talk to somebody. See if they can help figure out what's going on. Why are you so sad all the time? One of the things I truly believe would help our young people, and you hear me say this all the time. One of the things I know that's just destroying them is social media. These little devices. And I've told you, ladies and gentlemen, especially you young, don't, that, that is not a pacifier. Stop giving your kid the phone so they will just leave you alone. That is not a pacifier. It will destroy them. They will spend their entire day just doing this. They won't even look up. You can call their name. They don't even pay you no attention. Because they, that's all they do all day long. If you ask young people today, you got you to gotta make them go outside. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get outside. You got to make them go outside. My whole day was I can't wait to go outside because inside it was mop the floor, do this, do that, make up your bed, clear up your room. Blah. I couldn't wait to get outside. The moment I was free, you hear the door bang open. Poof. 
Stop banging my door. I'm gone. All day, I'm gone. If you ask your young person today to go outside, you know what they will say? Ain't nothing to do outside. God, help me. Help me. Go outside for what? Ain't nothing to do outside. The whole world is outside. We have to make up stuff to do. It used to rain. And and the water would be running down the, the, the street going to the drain. And I would get two pieces of grass and race them. It's always something to do outside. Isolation. Our young people are living in isolation. Staring at a screen. They're staring back at them. Poverty. The poverty rate is ridiculous in the black community for our kids. They, call, they actually call it childhood poverty. They're dealing with that. And then, of course, there's still, there's always racism and white supremacy. There's always still the racism, which makes black people, young and old, feel like they are less than. And there's the eternalized racism that because I'm black, I'm not as good as somebody else. Our young people deal with that. So let me quickly get to the scripture. What stopped the jailer from killing himself? The jailer was about to commit suicide. That's verse 27. Matter of fact, bring verse 27 up. Chapter 16, verse 27. The jailer was about to commit suicide. He woke up, saw the prison doors open, drew his sword, and was about to commit suicide. And and I'm saying suicide just so you can let it sink in. Because, again, I think sometimes we read the Bible and we just miss it. It just goes like right over our head. You read it and he was about to kill himself and you just keep on reading. I'm like, this brother was about to commit suicide because he thought. He made an assumption that was false. And because of a false assumption, he was about to take his own life. A lot of our young people make the same false assumptions assumptions young people who are in here today if you make a mistake that's we all do you are not the mistake you know the difference between shame and guilt guilt is i've done something shame is i am something and a lot of our young people live with the shame thinking i am Stupid. I am a mistake. I am a failure. No, you're not. Nobody is a mistake. Nobody is a failure. Nobody is stupid. We all do stupid things. We all make mistakes. We all fail. But as my brother said, when you fall, God will give you a cushion to cushion your fall. If you take it so far that whatever the mistake I made is, whatever the failure that I have, I think I should just take my life. Then you are ending your life way too soon. I know this sounds trite. And I hate being trite. I know this sounds trite. But suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary issue. Whatever you're going through, however hard it is, if you turn your face to God and your trust in God, if you call somebody, if you talk to somebody, they can help walk you through it. He was going to kill himself in verse 27, but verse 28, suicide prevention took place because there was somebody who cared. Here's what Paul, go to verse 28. Paul says this, and this is what I say, ladies and gentlemen, young people, do not harm yourself. Do not harm yourself. Paul let him know somebody cares. 
the least of likely a person. I, I care. Don't harm yourself. Y'all beat me, flogged me, threw me in jail. God opened the doors. We didn't run. You talking about killing yourself, bro? Don't don't kill don't kill yourself. No, you, you live. Matter of fact, you you learn later. Man got a family. The man has a wife and kids. He has a family. He's got a home. He's got a job. Do not kill yourself. Don't kill yourself. And he said this, finally, he said, because we are all here. We're all here. Last Sunday, I think it was, my wife took our daughter up to Westchester. I think some, one of the kids had a birthday party or, and, and, and it was a place called The Edge up in Westchester. It was it Westchester, right? And it's a place for youth in Westchester. Now, some of y'all live in Westchester. I appreciate that. But if you in Evanston, <laughs> Madisonville and Avondale, Roseline, that's still Westchester. So in Westchester, they got this beautiful place for kids to come every day after school. Everything they could ever want, they got it for the kids. And most of the kids, I'm sure, up there who show up, it may be a few of us, but not a bunch of us. Paul said, do not harm yourself because we are here. So I sent, my, my wife went and, and British went, but my wife was on a reconnaissance mission, mission. Find out how this thing works. Because we need to be doing that here. Right in the hood. Because every kid can't get to Westchester. And every parent is not driving them to Westchester. It needs to be right here. Bring back the information so we can do it here, which says to our children, don't harm yourself. Why? Because we are here. That was the message. That was the suicide prevention message. The first thought for the young man is, bro, your perception is wrong. You think nobody cares. You're wrong. You think you're a failure. You're not. You think somehow life would be better on earth without you. Not true. We need you. Yeah, I understand all that you're going through. I understand all the risk factors. And my heart aches for that. But guess what, young man, young woman? We are here. I'm pastor of New Prospect Baptist Church. I don't want to lose not one of the young people in our church. I don't want a phone call. I don't want a phone call from a parent or a grandparent telling me that one of our children took their life. Your life is too precious. Your life is precious. We got to know the warning signs. He just basically told him, we're here for you. We're here for you. That's it. We're here for you. Protective measures. Some of the protective measures, protective factors. I told you the risk factors, the abuses, but the protective factors are this, and I'll let you go home. One is family cohesion. I believe, yeah, there was suicide back in the day, but also the black family was stronger back in the day. It was stronger back in the day. The family has to get back together again. Extended family. I know we've, we, we've moved all across the country and both sides of my family grew up in Lincoln Heights. Mama and daddy, one street over. Everybody was in Lincoln Heights. Everybody. And I, I could go from this house to this house to this house to this house. Everybody. Now we are spread out now. But somebody's got to bring the family together. 
I do hundreds of funerals. You know how many times I hear it, ladies and gentlemen, at your funerals? Somebody will get up. Y'all, we need to get together more than just funerals. Now, I don't know if they say that at white folk funerals or not, but I know we say it at black folk funerals. Somebody will stand up. Y'all, we need to get together more than just funerals. I agree. Then do it. Do it. Our young people need social networks. They need family. They need social networks. I told you, they don't go outside. But at least get, get, get on a team. Do something. Get in an after-school program. Do something. And then they need spiritual guidance and faith. They need God in their lives. So what was interesting about this passage, what was powerful is that they prevented a suicide. What was interesting is that after the man took him home, fed him, you know where he took him? Right back to jail. (laughs) And they didn't fight him. They said, all right, and nobody left. He took him right back to prison. And the very next day, God freed him for good. But the man kept his job, saved his whole family, and he was about to take his own life. Make sure, make sure you get one of these sheets of paper when you leave here today. This is the crisis hotline. It's 988. Make sure your young person knows this number. You so worried about them calling 241 kids. They they didn't, they didn't tricked you on that one. So you run around the house. I wish you would call 241 kids on me. No, they need to know 911 and 988. And you can call 988 young people when you just feeling down. You can talk to somebody. They're there 24-7 just to talk to you. Because it may be hard to talk to mama and grandmama and whoever. It was something said yesterday at a funeral for Brother Tony Lewis and continued to pray for his family. He lost his mom. She was 88 years old. And Tony's daughter got up and gave her remarks about her grandmother. And she said, I just thank God for my grandmother because she was there for me. She said, when I came out, grandmama was supportive of me. Sometimes you need somebody who's going to be supportive of you. You don't always need to be judged. Somebody just has to say, I love you no matter what. Make sure they get this sheet. I don't know how many of these they have. This one is colorful. It is entitled Suicide Warning Signs for Youth. If our youth are fragile, then you got to be concerned. I'm serious, brothers and sisters. Please do not take this lightly. Do not sit there and act like that ain't my kid. No, 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 no. I'd rather think it just might be my kid. Yeah, that's the way I see it. It just might be my kid. I'm not going to sit there and say, that ain't my kid. My kid would never do that. That's the craziest thinking I've ever heard. It just might be my kid. And so whatever help I can get him or her. So make sure you get as much of this information as you can. And so we can be involved in prevention and that our young people get the lives that we had, long life. What did Dr. King said? He said, I would love to live a long life. Longevity has its place. I want all of our kids to live a long life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give God some pan this morning. Amen. I don't know if our young people were up here today or if they're downstairs. I want to make sure they get this information downstairs, but I want you to get it when you leave here today. Let us please stand. Let us stand.
Let us stand. As we are standing, as we are standing, this is an opportunity. This is an invitation for anybody in here today who's looking for a church home, a place of worship, a place where they want to be part of a growing family. This is an invitation, and the invitation works like this. I'm just asking you to step out of the aisle and walk down here to the front of the church and say, Lord, I'm coming. I give you my life. I want this to be my church home. And our job is to accept you and to love you in Jesus' name and to watch God do some great things in your life. So if you're anywhere in the building and you're looking for a church in the city of Cincinnati, please just walk down the aisle. We will welcome you this morning, this afternoon, into the body of Christ. You can come now. in the house if you're age 10 to 25 age 10 to 25 I need you to come up here I need you to take one of these here Adrian as they come hand them one of those sheets age 10 to 25 come get this sheet please means that you do your best to hang on seek help call somebody the song says don't give up on God because he won't give up on you and God is able now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest rule and abide with us all henceforth now and forever amen God bless you. Have a good day, good week. Go in peace.